Okay, there is joy, and joy is the source of good humor. I believe all this good humor you saw in Jesus Christ, in the nicknaming, in what he did when he walked on water, and the source of it all is his joy. Now, I have one more last big question to ask, and that is, why do we need this? And serious people will often ask this question. Why humor in the first place? Let's get on with the job. Don't humor us. People will say that sometimes. And is Jesus, when he humors us, is he doing something dangerous? Is there something dangerous when Jesus gives nicknames to the disciples or when he walks on water and when he turns water into wine and when he tells parables? Uh, and look at the Good Samaritan parable in which he takes the dreaded foes of the Jews, the Samaritans, who had been... Who had been unfaithful to the Jews during the, <laughs> the battle of the Maccabean revolt, during that revolt against the Syrians. You know why there's such bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans? It's because during that revolt, when Judas Maccabees and his brothers fought against the Syrians, which is the source of the great Jewish uh, celebration of Hanukkah, guess who sided with the Syrians against the Jews? The Samaritans. And so there's real reason why the Jews are bitter against the Samaritans. And look what Jesus does, the jokester, when he tells the parable of the good Samaritan. <laughs> and now he, for, for all time, we have it in our law that if you help someone on the side of the road as a good Samaritan, you can't be sued. And it's called good, the good Samaritan clause. Jesus came up with it. And the Jews, I, I don't blame the, the disciples, the Jews, saying, what in the world? You pick him as a hero. It's like the good communist came down the road communist came down the road and he helped this man and then from then on we talk about the good communist the good samaritan that's a joke see jesus didn't win any friends with that joke but it is a joke and why did he do that and uh, why do we need uso shows for soldiers during world war ii or vietnam it, it certainly is a big disruption of their of discipline and the time that they need to be getting ready and getting there wouldn't it be better just to get their weapons polished and ready for battle why do we have to have USO shows? Is humor, in other words, after all, an unnecessary luxury? Is it an add-on in a family's life? And then, well, as long as we're, we're complaining about that, what about music and pipe organs? And guitars, throw them in too. Why do we need those? Why should there be music programs in schools and drama programs for kids? You think about it for a minute. Are these things add-ons? And the most important things are learning about computers. The most important things are learning math. The most important things are learning science. The most important things are learning political science, how to run countries and stuff like that. And why humor? It seems like it's an add-on. But I'll tell you, if you take the New Testament seriously, you have to say, no, they're not add-ons. If humor and laughter, now follow me, if it comes from joy, from the fact that God smiled, then it isn't extraneous. It's not something additional, but it's flowing from the center. And that's the way joy is treated in the New Testament. It flows from the center. It's what happened to the disciples the night when Christ had conquered death and they were glad when they saw the Lord. And I'll bet there was a lot of laughing in that upper room. And there was certainly a lot of laughing after that breakfast at the Lake of Galilee. <laughs> and James, who says, you know, have you ever climbed a mountain? I'll tell you, you know, the, the best part of climbing a mountain is when you're back down. It's really true. I've done it a lot of times. I've climbed Mount Shasta 50 times the summit. And the best part is when you're back down you're back at the motel having a prime rib dinner. <laughs> That's the best part, climbing the mountain. And you realize that we made it. And you look up there and you realize your foot was on the top of that thing, but you made it and came back alive. And I'll tell you, that is a big moment. And that's James. You know, there's a joy in knowing we just made it. I love the fact that he just puts it that way. We just made it. We made it alive. And then the best of all joys is the joy of fellowship. 
knowing that Jesus Christ is nearby. And C.S. Lewis captures this so wonderfully. After the great scene in Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, when the great stone table broke, and Aslan tells Lucy, uh, tells Lucy and Susan that what the witch did not know was she knew the deep magic, and the deep magic was that every traitor belongs to wickedness, belongs to the witch. And that's why Edmund belonged to the witch. But the witch really wanted Aslan. So when the great golden lion said, you really want me, you don't want Edmund, take me in place of Edmund. And she did. And then she tied him to the stone table and she took a dagger and she killed him. But what she didn't know, she knew the deep magic, that all evil, when you commit evil, you belong to the Lord of evil. And that's been true for all time. You heard it in the proverb. If you set a trap, to capture someone, you're going to end up in the trap you set. God is not mocked whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. That's judgment. And that's the deep magic. And the wicked witch, Lewis put that in that story. The witch knew it. And that's why she says to Aslan, I have a right to take Edmund and to kill him because Edmund committed treachery and all traitors belong to me. That's a terrifying moment in Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. And then Aslan says to Jadis, you really want me, don't you? So she kills Aslan. And the girls are heartbroken. And they're there. And the little mice are eating away the, the, the ropes that have tied the great golden lion. That's why Reepicheep is a hero later on, because he was a descendant of those mice. And they nibbled away at those ropes. And there he is. And then finally they hear a crack. And the stone table breaks. And they look around, they're looking for Aslan, the great lion, and he's not there. And then his fur, his mane has come back because she had shaved it all off. And he says, here I am. And he's alive. Just like Jesus on the day of resurrection. And everybody was so excited. And then Aslan says to the children, the witch knew the deep magic that all traitors belong to her. But she didn't know that there was a magic older than the deep magic, that when someone who committed no sin died in place of someone who sinned, then time would go backward. That's how Lewis decided to explain the resurrection. She didn't know that. Evil is not as smart as it thinks it is. All the devil can do is tempt you with lies. The devil cannot do anything ultimate. That's why Martin Luther said, one little word shall fell him. Lord Sabaoth, his name. Jesus Christ. And when that dawns on you, then you have joy. Now, it's not over, though. Guess what Aslan says to the girls? He says, all right, girls, we've got to have fun now. And they romp and they play with Aslan, and they jump on Aslan's back, and they ride through Narnia, and that's the way the book ends. Going over uh, in huge walls and setting little stone people alive again, and, and that's the end of Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. And I've often thought, Lewis put his finger on something very big there. What is the real source of joy? It's fellowship with Christ. Being able to ride on Aslan's back. And that's what Paul saw. He says, rejoice, Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone know your unflappability, your mellowness. You can relax. The Lord is nearby. He's your friend. And that's joy. And that's the source of humor. And when that happens, you have fun. You have fellowship. And... Uh, uh, I would like to just wonder with you a little bit about some of the ways you have fellowship in your life now and the way you can bring joy into your life now. It's not extraneous. It's essential. It's flowing out of the center. Now, what do you do to have joy in your life? I'm going to give you just a couple of suggestions for having joy in your life and having humor in your life. I'm going to give you the most important suggestion. The biggest source of humor... You will, have, you will be the most humorous person if you have a high Christology. Karl Barth said, tell me how it stands with your Christology and I'll tell you who you are. 
The people with no sense of humor have a very elaborate theology often, but they have a low Christology. The bigger Jesus Christ is, the more he's able to cope with all problems. You don't have to worry about uh, so many problems that are worrying so many other people. And you don't have to worry about charts about the future because he holds the future anyway. I love Lewis's line. You, there's no point. You might as well commit the future into his hands. It's in his hands whether you commit it to him or not anyway. And when you have a high Christology and you commit the future into his hands, you then relax and you enjoy life. And it's, it's really true. The higher your Christology, when I realize that Jesus Christ is greater than all the tragedies and all the uh, uh, hardships and, and heartbreaks of the world, that means that, and also the judges of the world, he is the one who has the last word. This is Paul in Romans 8. And when I know that he has the last word, he's the only one that can say the last word, it gives me that freedom and gives me that joy. And uh, so that's my, that's my advice. The biggest uh, joy comes from uh, having first a high Christology and then, uh, then you just simply build humor into your life. And I'll give you a couple suggestions on that. Uh, I'm going to give you just a few suggestions on how to build a humor into your life. First, start with a high Christology. Start with who Christ is in your life. That's why I gave you these three sources of joy. And then make joy and goodness a focus point for your meditation. You know, we don't have the empty your mind doctrine of meditation, like in Zen Buddhism. We have the focus your mind doctrine of meditation tradition. So meditate on joy. Meditate on the mirth of God. Look for it. Welcome it in your house. Focus on, meditate on the goodness and the joyousness of God. And then create traditions in your family that tell about funny things that happen in your life. And avoid the stories that trash and diminish people in your life. Uh, create the stories that are fun in your family. Collect humorous memories. Make albums. Uh, read aloud. Do these little practical things in a family that create uh, humorous traditions. And then create active, hands-on, physical, fun experiences. It's never too late to do this. Where there's a lot of healthy touching, a lot of adventures and fun, do this with yourself, with your family, with friends. And when do you start? Uh, it's not too late. You just start and do it now. Uh, so those are my suggestions on how you make humor a part of your life. Focus on it, uh, read funny things, uh, create verbal traditions where you, within your own family life, you create the good traditions of the humorous moments of your life and then do hands-on things that are just downright fun. And for you, what fun may be for you is not the same as somebody, hey, find out what is fun for your family and for people around you and do them. That's why I made my list uh, this is kind of a media-centered list. I will defend the list a little bit with you. My 12 funniest writers, uh, if you want to start, my list may help you. Uh, and I, here they are. And, and you can read them for yourself. I've already given you a couple of uh, examples. And the, I've even listed the 12 funniest comedians that I've ever seen. I don't know who your favorites are, but uh, I put Jonathan Winters, uh, as far as living ones, at the top. W.C. Fields, the best bumbling put-down artist there ever was. Lucille Ball, by far America's funniest woman, it seems to me. Dick Van Dyke uh, had a marvelous human touch and impudence, especially in the, uh, the movies that he did, the great uh, uh, Mary Poppins. My favorites, Ray, uh, Ray Goulding and Bob Elliott, just tremendous. Red Skelton, Jack Benny. Okay, and then I even give you my list of the 12 funniest movies I've seen, and you can have your own list. Uh, some sleepers are in there, I think. A lot of people wouldn't think of Good Morning Vietnam as, I think it's one of the greatest movies ever made. I, I put into my 12 greatest American movies ever made is Good Morning Vietnam. Absolutely a profound movie and not a single throwaway character. I always judge movies as to whether there are throwaway characters in the movies. There's not a throwaway character at all in Good Morning Vietnam or in Singing in the Rain or in Wizard of Oz. 
Mary Poppins. And uh, anyway, I gave you my list. Strictly Ballroom at the bottom is kind of a, just a spoof, fun kind of uh, film that just totally took us by surprise. Some people told us, you got to go see that film. We went and saw it, and we thought it was so funny. And then I even listed 12 greatest Broadway musicals, not necessarily because they're the funniest at all, but just great musicals. Because I happen to think that musicals are a marvelous uh, way to, for a family to have uh, totally enjoyable experiences together. I should have put one more on there. I should have definitely put West Side Story as a tie with Fan of the Opera and should have got it on my list. But uh, I got criticized by my kids for that, not getting West Side Story on there. But at any rate, uh, that would be my list of the greatest musicals. Uh, I'm going to have one last reading for you. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to. I, thought, I ran out of time, frankly. I didn't. I was going to have. Uh, I was going to do a uh, time for question and answer and dialogue. And man, I should have had a, another hour, but I didn't get the other hour. So, and I did want to do these readings. I hope that was okay to throw the readings in for you. So I'm going to do one more reading. Uh, oh dear, so I have time. Maybe I have time for two readings. Well, we'll do it. Uh, I'm trying to debate between Robert Benchley or Garrison Keillor. And I'll do Robert Benchley first and then Garrison Keillor. Okay, this is, a, this is off the wall, but this is my kind of humor. And uh, I have a lot of fun with this kind of humor. Do insects think? It's one of his pieces he wrote in New Yorker magazine. He wrote a lot of pieces in New Yorker magazine. In a recent book entitled The Psychic Life of Insects, Professor Bouvier says that we must be careful not to credit the little winged fellows with intelligence when they behave in what seems like an intelligent manner. They may be only reacting. I would like to confront the professor with an instance of reasoning power on the part of an insect which cannot be explained away in any such manner. During the summer of 1899, while I was at work on my treatise, Do Larvae Laugh, we kept a female wasp at our cottage in the Adirondacks. It really was more like a child of our own than a wasp, except that it looked more like a wasp than a child of our own. That was one of the ways we told the difference. It was still a young wasp when we got it, 13 or 14 years old, and so for some time we could not get it to eat or drink. It was so shy. Since it was a female, we decided to call it Miriam, but soon the children's nickname for it, Pudge, became a fixture and pudge it was from that time on. One evening, I had been working late in my laboratory, fooling around with some gin and other chemicals. And, <laughs> and in the leaving the room, I tripped over a nine of diamonds, which someone had left lying on the floor, and knocked over my card catalog containing the names and addresses of all the larvae worth knowing in North America. The cards went everywhere. I was too tired to stop and pick them up that night and went sobbing to bed, just as mad as I could be. As I went, however, I noticed the wasp flying around in circles over the scattered cards. Maybe Pudge will pick them up, <laughs> I said half laughingly to myself, never thinking for one moment that that would be the case. When I came down the next morning, Pudge was still asleep over in her box, evidently tired out. And well she might have been, for there on the floor lay the cards scattered all about just as I had left them the night before. The faithful little insect had buzzed around about all night trying to come up to some decision about picking them up and arranging them in the catalog box and then figuring out for herself that as she knew practically nothing about larvae of any sort except wasp larvae, she would probably make more of a mess of rearranging them than if she left them on the floor for me to fix. It was just too much for her to tackle. And discouraged, she went over and lay down in her box where she cried herself to sleep. If that's not an answer, to Professor Bouvier's statement that insects have no reasoning power, I do not know what is. <laughs> it's Robert Benchley. I told you it was off the wall. <laughs> okay, one last Garrison Keillor. I'm going to have to just, 
excerpt a little bit of this because it is uh, a fairly long one, but uh, it's one of my very favorites. And uh, here it is. It's been, a little, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon. It's been hot and dry. Everyone is extremely touchy. So when you walked into the chatterbox for lunch and sat at the counter, you got a cup of coffee and looked at the menu, finally ordered what you would have every day, a bowl of chili and grilled cheese, and turned to Ed on your left and were set to say something, then you hesitated, even to say, boy, she's a hot one, might start something. So you make it a question and ask, say, I wonder how hot she's supposed to get today anyway. And he says, how the hell should I know? What? You think I sit listening to the damn radio all day? So you see that people are in a bad mood. That's how hot it was. So hot you didn't dare ask. And no rain, but muggy, so the dust sticks to your face. Doesn't seem fair for the Midwest, the nation's icebox, to be the nation's oven, too. It's like living in the Arctic, but spending your summers in Death Valley. Even the side, the side track tap, where men sit in air-cooled comfort in dim light, to medicate themselves against anger and bitterness. They were touchy too. It's so good to step out of the hot, dirty day into a cool tavern and hold a bottle of Wendy's. But two or three Wendy's later, it's so awful to go back out. After an hour in the dark, the sunlight hits you like, two hour, like a two by four and the beer in your head heats up and the yeast grows and the brain rises. And when a man on a hot day who's enjoyed an hour of fellowship gets up to leave, he knows he's dug a hole for himself. So anyway, now he introduces us to Wally. The portly gent in the cool dark behind the bar is Wally. He recently bought a boat, a 26-foot pontoon boat with a green striped canopy, 36 horsepower outboard, four lawn chairs, a barbecue grill, which arrived Sunday by flatbed truck, flatbed truck and was put in the water off Art's fishing dock. It was christened the Agnes D. after his mother. He and Evelyn took a maiden voyage in twilight. It was cool out there under the canopy with a nice breeze off the lake. Wally stood at the tiny wheel midship, wearing a white skipper cap. His ship was only a piece of plywood, 26 by 12, on two steel pontoons. But to him, standing, steering it, it was majestic. He wanted to hang lights on it from bow to stern, port, left, starboard, right sides. He gunned it. Not so fast, Evelyn said. You don't have to drive the boat so fast. My love, he said, you don't drive a boat. You drive a car. You sail a boat. And when you sail a boat, you need to find out what she's got under the hood. She'd never heard him talk like that. <laughs> Now, uh, what's happened, of course, I'm going to have to skip a little section. There, uh, he has this boat, and uh, he discovers that uh, the pastor, Invest, has invited some Lutheran ministers to come for a, a study tour of Lake Wobegon. <clears throat> he invited about 100 couples. Uh, uh, he, he, well, first, Clarence Bunsen has invited a lot of people to see the boat, but then... Uh, uh, when he invited Mayor Clarence Bunsen to come for a cruise, Clint said, you know what you ought to do? There's a bunch of Lutheran ministers coming through on a tour Friday. We ought to give them a boat ride so they get a nice look at town. How and why 24 Lutheran ministers were touring rural Minnesota is a long digression that I'd rather skip, dear reader. People are so skeptical. They force a storyteller to spend too much time on the details and not enough on the moral. So I'll just say that the five-day tour, quote, meeting the pastoral needs of rural America, quote, unquote, was organized by an old seminary pal of Pastor Inkves, the Reverend J. Peter Larson, who called him in April and said, you know what our problem is? We're so doggone theological we can't see past the principles to the people. And the people are hurting. So I'm organizing a tour to 100 ministers to go and look at rural problems and I want to visit Lake Wobegon in mid-July. Fine, said David Inquest, who forgot about it until last Sunday. His wife Judy said, Where, what's this on the calendar for Friday? Tour, Larson, here. Oh, that, he said. Well, I was mean to discuss that with you. It's some Lutheran ministers coming into town. I thought we could have them over for a picnic supper in the backyard. 
How many, she said. I don't know exactly, but certainly no more than a hundred. <laughs> well, I think you best bet be, with best bet would be wieners. You probably just want to boil them. Maybe you could get somebody to make some potato salad. Rural problems what it, is what Pete wanted to see, but you can't take a crowd of ministers around to someone's house and point to him and say, there's one, he's in trouble. I don't give him long. No, sir, he's headed down the chute. Clint Bunsen thought it was strange if a minister visits, you hide your problems and shine up your children and put them through their paces. And you talk about other people's problems. But he agreed to talk to them about the municipal affairs and when he got the brilliant idea of the boat trip. And when they arrived, tired and hot and dusty at five o'clock on Thursday, that was the plan, a boat trip, a speech on board, roasted weenies, fellowship at the inquest four gallons of wine, $4.39 a piece. They got off the bus and Clint thought, ministers, men in their 40s, mostly a little thick around the middle, thin on top, puffy hair around the ears, <laughs> some fish medallions, turtleneck pullovers, earth tones, hush puppies. But more than dress, what set them apart was the ministerial eagerness. More eye contact than you really were looking for I shouldn't be reading this, really. <laughs> a longer handshake and a little more affirmation than you needed. Good to see you. Glad you could be here. Nice of you to come. We're very honored, they said to him, although they were the guests and he was the host. <laughs> down this way, let's go down to the lake. Pastor Inquest wore yellow Bermuda shorts and sunglasses. It's been an incredible trip, Pete said. Really amazing. They strolled down from Bunsen Motors and down the alley behind Ralph's and along the path between Mrs. Mueller's yard, Elmer and Myrtle's. Myrtle's cat lay on the limb of an apple tree. Its long gray tail hung down, twitching at the tip. Well, Wally had gone all out. The Agnes D was hung with two strings of Christmas lights, the kind that twinkle on and off. He had laid on five cases of pop, keg of beer, and enough hamburger patties to feed the freshman class. The 24 men trooped up the plank and on the deck. As she sank lower and lower in the water, Clint was the last on board. He thought, I'm not sure about this, but how do you tell some ministers to get off? The church invites us all. The concept is of that's enough for now isn't part of Lutheran teaching. So Clint stepped lightly aboard, trying not to put all his weight on it. And he felt the water slosh in his shoe. The boat was riding low, no doubt about it. Wally thought, I am not sure about this. <laughs> but he didn't want to sound worried like an amateur. A true sailor would be hearty. He yelled, cast off the bow line. Pastor Inquest leaned over to cast off, and the Agnes D tilted to starboard. Wally gunned the engine. She righted herself, and off they went at about four miles per hour. With little waves lapping at the sides, so low in the water that to people on shore, it looked like a miracle. <laughs> One problem with 24 men on a 26-foot boat is that in the Midwest, you need to stand about 28 inches or more from each other. Otherwise, we get headaches. With the steering post, the lawn chairs, the motor, the canopy, the pop cases, the barbecue grill, the card table, there wasn't room. Men herded forward to the sides, there was a clearing of throats, and excuse me, as 24 men edged away from each other and into each other, and that was before the coals got hot. <laughs> Wally poured half a can of lighter fluid on them and lit them just before departure. As the heat rose, ministers sitting near the grill edged away toward the bow. There were too many Lutherans squeezed into too small a space, and the barbecue shooting up sparks and men ducking and edging. Wally thought, if we'll just get up a little more speed, I'll bet the bow would come up a bit. Pete was saying to Pastor Inquest, Dave, I don't have the answers, but I think that all of us will come out of this with a feeling of unity of concern. <laughs> but Dave was feeling his own concern. They were sinking, and he didn't know how to mention it in a way that wouldn't seem negative. <laughs> Wally was at the wheel calling, steady as she goes. <laughs> and 24 nervous ministers in earth tones and suede shoes, edging, shifting, hurting, trying to be good listeners. 
share concerns as the fire got hotter and hotter, <laughs> driving them toward the bow, which was sinking, but all of them trying to keep a good positive attitude. And then Dave said, somebody put out the fire, we're sinking. Five men took their beer cups and leaned over to, <laughs> and leaned over to dip up water, and the Agnes D. tipped. The front pontoon went under, and the Agnes D. stopped dead in the water and turned to port, and they had reached the edge of the laws of physics. They lurched to the starboard side, and both pontoons went under there. In full view of town, the boat pitched forward and dumped some ballast. Eight Lutheran ministers in full informal garb took their step for total immersion. <laughs> As the boat sank, they slipped over the edge to give their lives for Christ. But in only five feet of water, it's been a hot summer, eight went over and then the Agnes D came up again a little and the survivors grabbed to hold on. But then the grill tipped over and they were turning turning to see a hundred burning coals sliding down the deck toward them. The book of Revelation come to life. <laughs> and they plunged overboard like a load of hay bales. And the Agnes D rose, bow rose, and Wally turned to Clint, hanging on to the canopy and said, I think I've got her under control now. <laughs> and the minister stood perfectly still in the water and didn't say much at all. Five feet of water and some of them not six feet tall, so their faces were upraised, upraised to the bright blue sky. They didn't dare walk for fear of drop-offs. Their clothes were too heavy to swim and they couldn't call for help because their voices were too deep and mellow. So they stood, faces upturned in prayerful apprehension. 24 ministers standing up to their smiles in water, chins up trying to understand this experience and its deeper meaning. And then Clint's little nephew, Brian, waded out to them. It's not deep this way, he said. He stood about 15 feet away, a little boy up to his waist, and they followed him out, single file. <laughs> Garrison Keeler. Uh, well, I want to lead in a prayer and thank you very much for coming to my class today and the new college class. And uh, if you're ever in Seattle, come to University Presbyterian Church, 4540 15th Avenue Northeast. We'd love to have you. Hey. Lord, thank you for this uh, chance to be together. Thank you for joy, which is the source of all great humor. Thank you for the mirth that maybe is the great secret that you have. Now, that secret that you enjoy us, that you smile at us. Lord, may we learn to smile and learn how to make our family smile and all the people we love enjoy life. Lord, we thank you. There are tragic moments of life, too. But they, uh, they do not swallow up or destroy the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, or the joy. Because you are the Lord even at the end of our life like you are at the middle and the beginning of our lives. So thank you, Lord. Bless us and help us to grow in grace and grow in humor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And thanks a lot for being here today.